Okay, so I guess let's just start with introductions and who's here, and I would suppose why you're here, potentially what projects you might be working on pertinent to the topic, and uh, we'll just go from there, see what happens. Sounds good. Eric? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I, Eric Mackey. Um, been in Crestone a long time, seen a lot of gray water systems specifically, and seen most of them fail miserably. Um, so I've got that experience to lend directly to the conversation. And what are you working on out of your product, uh, pro oh, out at your property, Eric, that would, uh, pertain to this subject matter? <laughs> <laughs> Cause I know it's a monumental project we're about to embark on out there. Well, yeah, I mean, along with the energy fair bathhouse, I'd like to see, um, I'd also like to be looking at ways to get my own dwelling off of the um, off of the septic system and onto uh, gray water system. Get the bath and kitchen water, you know, isolated and be using it instead of putting it all into the septic system. So longer term, you know, working with you on your project, Donovan, and. You know, figuring out how to incorporate that into an already built structure. It's, it's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah, I need all the help and ideas I can get with that one. It's going to be fun to see how it goes. Yeah, I, I, I'll pass it on to Jeff here. Jeff, what you up to these days? Uh, I'm working on a scaled down gray water system. Um made most likely out of three 55 gallon drums um and for the purpose of um uh diverting gray water from a tiny house so a scaled down tiny gray water system um and also it's going to be a learning experience and i'm going to be drawing from uh you know from wastewater treatment uh texts uh, uh, books and uh, materials that uh, those who work in uh, water and wastewater would follow. So um, following the, the testing and the procedures to uh, ensure that the water coming, the effluent, the water coming out of the gray water system is, um, you know, good quality. So those are my, it, it's, it's a, it's going to be, it's both a personal project and a, um, uh, learning or experimental project for, uh, uh, would you say industrial scale? No, like subdivision scale, scale down, scale down. Well, you're scaling micro. down, but you're, are you, are you, but I want to use, I want to use the, um, uh, industrial scale, uh, science. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as a disclaimer, uh, I have to say that I'm speaking just as a, a, uh, from a personal standpoint, um, and that I don't speak in any way, shape, or form for uh, my employer, which is the local water uh, district, and uh, that as a as a, as a water professional, though um, I'm interested in the treatment of gray water, and especially in my personal life, and so I'm vested as well in ensuring that such a system would be, you know, would meet or exceed the standards that we follow uh, at the Water District. So just want to get that out there, and uh, yeah, I'll pass it to Matt. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Matt Evers. Um, here to support Donovan, going diving full into it, going uh, legal with the water. Um, gray water. What an idiot. <laughs> I think it's a very... Uh, I think it's a very uh, cool move that he's doing. I think water is very sacred and um, precious, and uh, we take advantage of it. Um, I'm working on a, a system for a friend currently uh, in a greenhouse. Um, most of my experience comes from um, Earthship Biotexture. I've just been looking at what they've done. This is my first pro project with uh, gray water. I'm here to, I'm pretty novice, I'm here to learn. And yeah, just to support Donovan's movement to making it legal, because uh, I am not currently taking that route. And um, yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. So I'm Donovan. 
And this is all part of my general madness because I have decided to do a gray water system in a hybrid styled earth ship um, that is a modular based contained wetlands, planter cell, earth ship style, um, but with a bunch of extra things that does meet the Colorado gray water code and does meet the IBC gray water code. So I'm hoping to put these steps on video and start some semblance of a discussion, which obviously everyone has shown up tonight to sit around and get started and try to figure out where we are with the resource of water and how we handle it within our residences and within our households, um, because currently we handle it poorly. The only reason we actually have a water shortage is because we poorly allocate the resource. It's really unfortunate. Um, and so this is all part of reallocating that resource into the future, knowing that we can only live without water for approximately three days, depending upon how hardcore you are. It is one of the only resources that you cannot survive without. We could eat grass and survive probably for days on end, but without water and clean water to drink, we're dying really quickly. And currently we flush about six days worth of drinking water that will keep us alive every single day in our houses. Um, it's just a little unfortunate. Won't get into water and gar uh, grass and golf courses, but. Um, and I'm going to actually defer this next one to Jeff. I'm going to give him a moment to gather himself, realizing I'm about to put him on the spot. Um, Jeff, do you know about um, water uh, holding and circulation and how often it would need to circulate in order to keep it aerobic and not um, going uh, septic? Because that would be a piece of data that either you or Eric might actually know off the top of your head, and I'm not sure. Not off the top of my head. Okay, no, that's all right. No big deal. I know it's in the data, so we can pull that back out. But those are some things to also um, consider, because one of the things with the system that I'm developing is that I don't want to hear pumps running 24-7. Like, I don't want that hum in my house at night. I'm upset when I, my refrigerator kicks on. You design it to have to cycle aerobic, anaerobic. And then run it off a solar panel. So during the day, you're getting aerobic action. And then at night, when it's cooler anyway, it's going to hold oxygen. And then it goes aero it goes anaerobic. And that actually is, is beneficial. But that's where it's even more key that you have it vented properly to the outside. Because when it does go anaerobic, that's where you start getting the odors. But if you're cycling it, that should help you know, minimize the odors, but it, it'll help with any, uh, breakdown of, of, um, uh, you know, loading that you, that you might have, you know, just like incidental. In the yeah. Water. And that becomes the, the issue, right? Is when you have, um, the whole bathtub dump into the system and you have a huge load go into it, or you have a washing machine that just dumps all of that soap into the system right. all at one time. And, and, and you're looking at, so, you're looking at what are you loading into the water, and that's mainly phosphorus. And and part of the anaerobic cycles, at least on a, on a large scale, from my understanding, that's where anaerobic action comes into play to remove that phosphorus, which is key, you know, for for discharge permits. And and you know, you don't want to be polluting your surroundings with phosphorus. Same with you know, excessive amounts of nitrogen, which you ha would have more in your black water. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so now we get to the fun part. <laughs> so I've been doing research on gray water systems and earth ships. I'm an earth ship freak. I love them. I think they're the greatest thing. Thank you, Michael Reynolds. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you. You guys are amazing. We can't say enough wonderful things about what you've done for us. Um, but that being said, um, within such radical design evolution, we still have a few things that I feel are hiccups in the design phase. Primarily the grease trap and primarily how we filter and hold the water before it goes back to the toilets to make sure that we don't get that weird stenchy smell in the toilet because it's not clean enough gray water and so that we get away from staining our toilets instead of having to manufacture toilets that are this weird yellow color so we don't see the stains <laughs> oh, in them. <laughs> I 
kind of taking the long way around. <laughs> right. <laughs> we could all go down to Mexico and get those really ornate painted ones. There you go. There you go. <laughs> then you just can't see them. Um, so essentially we have a grease trap that's an issue and we have some incoming filtration that's an issue. Toilet stains, aroma, um, flushing with rainwater can get around that but the same thing we get into holding water and holding water starts to accumulate stuff and it starts to do things and we have to figure out how to filter it and hold it appropriately and cycle it and do some things and then well, the, and i can i can hear people out there now saying well why not just filter it and pump it through filters and at some point it becomes a losing operation to start throwing a whole bunch of energy and pumping and filters that you have to throw away or clean or everything has its drawbacks. You can't just throw more power and more filters and more stuff going into the landfill to deal with these problems. We need to find long-term workable solutions that aren't based on you know, continually dumping energy into the system in one form or another. What's the also the lowest energy for the greatest return on the amount of water that we get back out of the end of the system? You know, we can get beautiful, clear, clean water by dumping kilowatts at, at pumping and filtering, but the, part of the goal here is to save resources, not just hemorrhage more energy from the grid to filter this stuff. So that's part of why we're after the biofiltering, the gravity flow, you know, pump up and let it feed down, things like that that minimize energy and pumping, um, filtering systems that are either self-cleaning or easily cleanable or feed something, like do something with it. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and anyone who, who has ever had a water quality issue within their house who's had one of those two or three bay filter systems is very clear on the monumental amount of filters that you go through and what a disastrous reality that becomes quickly well yeah and i'm sure jeff has some input on the industrial side of having to pump and move all of that material from different locations to do different filtering or settling operations like there's a there's a big expenditure of of power that goes into that and i'm sure some throwaways too some yeah i can't i can't speak to 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 exact figures but well, uh, no. uh it's it you know it, it takes it takes a tremendous amount of of both uh uh electrical energy and as well as as you know, energy devoted to maintaining that, you know, that plant. Um, and in the process, I mean, the, the, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's resource intensive. And, and I agree with what you had to say about uh, letting gravity do its work because, you know, water flows downhill, let it do its thing. And you can do it in such a way where, uh, you know, if in stages, then uh, you can mimic cycles of life too, and you can mimic those stages at the treatment plant. You can learn what those cycles are and apply that at a smaller scale, but with less energy intensity because you're not having to like move it from point A to point B, and you know, and then it gets mixed in with everything else. You're, you're that that gray water is being held back, and and but there are still those processes that you can learn from the, from the treatment at an industrial scale and, and scale it down. Yeah. Well, and I think what you mentioned about, about natural systems as well and how, how does nature give us pure, clean mountain water, you know? And that's where we're at. So let's right. talk about that. Let's talk about taking... We know the filtration on the front end and the grease trap of the incoming water is a problem in gray water systems. It's a problem in restaurants. It's a problem <laughs> for sewer systems. I mean... Don't get it, me started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a big white suit. Disgusting wax clogs in sewer systems all over Europe and the U.S. And no, that, that fat, that grease is a disgusting mess for 
anyone who works in the, the sewer industry, my heart goes out to you for having to deal with that. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. It's definitely clogging the arteries of our, uh, our wastewater treatment systems. So um, it's, it's referred to in the industry as fog, fat, oils, greases. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Well, and once it starts to solidify, it forms a wax plug in sewer systems that is mind-boggling. Yeah, There's I mean, some it, great YouTube videos on that out there. Go, go check them out. You will be disgusted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lipids, you know, it, it, you know, the lipids are, are fats, oil, greases, and wax. Don't get lipid with me. Yeah, <laughs> ear, earwax. Yeah, yeah, turning into earwax. Yeah. Nice, um, Matt. Do you have anything? Um, I understand you recently had an interesting conversation with some of the folks down at Biotexture. Oh yeah, um, my buddy Justin, who uh, he's not with Biotexture anymore, and I never attended the academy, but. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much just, uh, there's a system that they do, and they have blueprints you can get from them, and I'm pretty much just out to um, simplify the system with, like, uh, pretty much not too much research. I'm kind of just, like, get it done and just see what happens, guy type dude. <laughs> and, uh, I'm right there with you. Man. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get the ball rolling on uh, actually building the system, and I think I've ironed out a lot of the issues with just uh, the personal system that I'm, I'm working on. Where as far as like grease traps and you know um, and stuff like that, so I can elaborate if you want on just the system I'm working on, where with charcoal filters and the recirc pump is pretty yeah, much love, yeah. Go ahead and yeah, yeah expand so on that. Let's talk just, about those because this this is where we're at in the dev- design phase of this functionality. Is we know the botanical cells are pretty well dialed in. We know how to size them. We even know some of the plants we can put in them. But our filtration system is hideous. It's just not working. So here's like a printout from, uh, you know, Earthship. And this is strictly for the gray water section of Earthship. And I think that their systems do work. And I think it's they're great for doing it. And obviously, this is my basis of an introduction to just the gray water. Yeah, topic. no, I agree. They they definitely are the, the leaders. So pretty much I'm, my... My shot here is to gain as much information from the people around me, Donovan, Jeff, Eric, Pete, too. Or, or, you know, he's an earth shipper himself. And so I'm just trying to simplify this and just make one holding cell, one planter cell, and just just straight one planter cell. And then, um, you know, with a charcoal box filter, um, Jeff and Donovan got a chance to come over to the project I was working on, and they advised to put... Um, like an aeration system in the bottom to keep it um, to keep the to keep it aerobic, you know. Instead of getting anaerobic and little pockets forming inside of um, the bed I'm working on, it's a pretty pretty large bed. I think it's what is like four feet wide by I don't know like twenty five. Yeah, twenty five foot long. It's a pretty massive yeah, bed that, inside that of a greenhouse. Right, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be pushes. Size. Yeah, it's got a lot of volume in it. Um, so my goal is, is, you know, we don't want pumps kicking on at night. And uh, what I was going to use is like a, a fountain, uh, like a solar fountain pump. And it's to, you know, it just kicks, it runs when it can in the daytime with its own designated solar panel. I'm just going to throw outside. I'm going to dig a hole under the tire wall to ventilate and to throw that panel outside to get the electric in to run the fountain pump. And the fountain pump is pretty much just going to pump it to the top of the planter cell. You know, the, my, this in this situation, the planter cell flows downhill. So it, that fountain pump will run when it has sun and then come out and expose itself to air into a charcoal box. So it'll be coming down into a charcoal box with a, um, a rock bulb um, that also goes to the bottom of the planter cell to, to, to push it back through down to the bottom. So that thing will be recircing anytime we got some full sun going. Um, we're going to kind of go for maybe a Hugel style thing where we put some bark and wood inside of our layer here um, instead of sand. Um, if you're not familiar with Hugel, you can look that up too. Um, and pretty much just, yeah. Uh, yeah, I really know where to go from there. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to shoot for. I haven't done it yet. It's in the pro- process, and I'm going to share the information when, when we're done on how it's functioning. And then as far as the grease trap goes, uh, it's just strictly going to be bathtub water and shower water to start out with because my system is above the ground, so I have to the water drains downhill. Um, amen to that, Jeff. 
into a 55 gallon drum, which I've buried in the ground. And then at every point in the day, at like the sunniest point in the day, my solar system will pump that dry because we're off grid. So we're really, uh, you know, energy conscious, like Mackie was saying, like, you know, you can't really throw endless power at the situation. And I know that water always needs to be moving. Like stagnation's a huge issue, off grid, gray water, especially we're in cisterns, you know, we're dealing with water cistern for our main supply of uh, clean water. So uh, you, you can't scoff at, at the amount of energy it takes to pump water uh, in designing off-grid power systems, the single biggest load usually is the well pump. Everything else kind of pales in comparison. Um, pumping water takes a tremendous amount of energy. That's so for sure. Even when you're talking about a small pump like that, you could still require a full 100-watt panel to power even just a small pump that may look fairly small and in, in, insignificant, but it's it's putting a lot of energy out to to move even a small amount of water. Yeah, so. and, that, um, and so that designated, um, you know, it's a fountain pump. I found it on, I forgot which website. I can pull it up and we can show it on the, the video. But yeah, it's pretty much just in this idea from my buddy and it was just, you know, fountain pump with this designated solar panel because I also have to run in this system two other pumps to make it all work. I have to run the pump that kicks on and empties the 55 gallon the, uh, drum in the ground. Um, and then I also have to power the pump that moves the water from, hopefully the clean gray water, from the end of the planter cell into the toilet so we can flush with that is what the goal is there. So I'm trying to give our big solar system a break and just keep that water circulating as much as possible. And we get plenty of sun here, so. What do you think, Jeff? You want to consider, you know, loss to evaporation. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. We also have a viewing tube to see how much uh, water is in the cell at all times. I don't. Th I think evaporate. I mean, that's I th yeah. Well, and as soon as you introduce plants, you're looking at at transpiration from the plants themselves, right. and in their own respiration cycle, they're pumping a lot of water up to do their thing to be able to filter the rest. You know. Yeah. So, how um, do you guys feel about that aeration solution? Possible solution. Instead of putting an uh, aeration system in and powering it with uh, the... I, I kind of feel like the uh, the aquarium industry has something to offer there with things like uh, aeration stones and air pumps that fine, are already fine bubble. high high efficiency. Um, those bubble stones are, are a porous, like a basically a pumice, puts out a fine mist of bubbles. Yeah. Um, and you can get those aeration stones in various sizes. I think that'd be worth trying. Yeah. Um, things like also the uh, the raised uh, uh, hydroponics beds back and forth where you pump it up and it all flows back down through uh, basically gravel, perlite, uh, some kind of medium in a trough and let it flow through, you know, filter, let the plants get theirs, but also filtering through the the whole medium there and that was kind of my so. idea with just the single going into the charcoal filter because i'm trying to just go baseline simple as possible right i just love simplicity um so before i build something like that i'm just gonna see where it goes oh we're talking garden <laughs> i like puzzles um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be 